Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my privilege to serve as the minister, along with the members, friends, children, and youth of this congregation. In Unitarian Universalism, we take a liberal approach to the practice of religion. We draw from many sources, sacred, secular, and scientific. As we live out our mission of embracing freedom, growing spiritually, loving with a whole heart, and doing our part to mend the wounded world. We come together in all the ways that we can at this time while being mindful of each other's health. It is part of our practice we honor those who have gone before. The lands in this area were the home of the Peoria people. They, too, created their own community. Each congregation in our tradition is sustained by the care, the skills, and the financial gifts of the members and friends. If you would like to make a donation, see the link uh, in the chat or at the end of the service. And while we gather online, it is always good to see visitors and new guests. Please help us get to know you. You're welcome to join our coffee hour after service. See a separate Zoom link in the closing slides. And if you'd like more information about the congregation, the best way is to contact us through the church website. I offer a note on language and inclusion. As humans, we are embodied beings. Each body is wonderful and unique in how it operates. When words in worship call for standing or shouting, I recognize how moving and participating is indeed different for each of us. Every one of us is invited to respond as best we are able including when our response is simply in the spirit. Our hymns and our music come from several sources. I want to thank the Association for Unitarian Universalist Music Ministries for permission to share their production of Reverend Jason Shelton's King for a Day. Thank you also to Jess Hutman for the video and music of Can I See Another's Woe? Thank you also to the Community Church of New York, Unitarian Universalist, for their version of Answering the Call of Love. And lastly, I want to acknowledge the family of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the King Center of Atlanta. They are the keepers of his words and his messages. And they also know how much communities like this take up his words on a day such as today. We are grateful for the opportunity to share Dr. King's messages in worship. And finally, I want to welcome the Sedona Unitarian Universalist Fellowship into worship with us today. I hope everyone has a chance to visit during coffee hour. Thank you to Ron Berkey for suggesting that we buddy up for this Sunday. It is a pleasure to widen the circle of our religious community. And now, let us enter into worship.
to stand up, shout and be heard. I've got to let my heart guide my words. I've got to steady my speed and say, what would it be like if you were king for a day? This morning's opening words are by Unitarian Universalist Minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley. It is said that ministers are here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I say, we are all afflicted and we are all comfortable. May our time together this morning be a comfort and a confrontation. May we here find peace in times of tumult. May we here invite tumult into lives of peace. May we here find calm in times of restlessness. May we here allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be the place you consider what you've never considered. Let this be the place you imagine for yourself something new and unthinkable. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in the world. Come, let us worship together. 
We light this chalice not because we must, but because we may. We light this chalice not because we have the truth, but because we each come bearing and seeking many truths. We light this chalice in connection across culture, distance, class, and language. We light this chalice that our religion may be a beacon. Of light, hope, and justice. We light this chalice to light our hearts and minds. Good morning. Today we are honoring Martin Luther King Jr. His life, his prophetic words, and his imaginings for a better future. In that spirit, I would like to share a story with you today called Martin's Big Words. Everywhere in Martin's hometown, he saw the signs white only. His mother said these signs were in all southern cities and towns in the United States. Every time Martin read the words, he felt bad until he remembered what his mother told him. You are as good as anyone. In church, Martin sang hymns. He read from the Bible. He listened to his father preach. These words made him feel good. When I grow up, I'm going to get big words too. Martin grew up. He became a minister like his father, and he used the big words he'd heard as a child from his parents and from the Bible. Everyone can be great. He studied the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. He learned how the Indian nation won freedom without ever firing a gun. Martin said love when others said hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He said together when others said separate. He said peace when others said war. Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together. In 1955, on a cold December day in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks was coming home from work. A man told her to get up from her seat on the bus so he could sit down. She said no and was arrested. Montgomery's black citizens learned of her arrest and it made them angry. They decided not to ride the buses until they could sit anywhere they wanted. For 381 days, they walked to work and school and church. They walked in rain and cold and in blistering heat. Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them until the white city leaders had to agree they could sit anywhere they wanted. When the history books are written, someone will say there lived black people who had the courage to stand up for their rights. In the next 10 years, black Americans all over the South protested for equal rights. Martin walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. White ministers told them to stop. Mayors and governors and police chiefs and judges ordered them to stop, but they kept on marching. Wait, for years I've heard the word wait. We have waited more than 340 years for our rights. They were jailed and beaten and murdered but they kept on marching. Some black Americans wanted to fight back with their fists. Martin convinced them not to by reminding them of the power of love. Love is the key to the problems of the world. Many white Southerners hated and feared Martin's words. A few threatened to kill him with his family. His house was bombed. His brother's house was bombed, but he refused to stop. 
Remember, if I am stopped, this movement will not be stopped because God is with this movement. The marches continued. More and more Americans listened to Martin's words. He shared his dreams and filled them with hope. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. After 10 years of protests, the lawmakers in Washington voted to end segregation. The white only signs in the South came down. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. cared about all Americans. He cared about people all over the world and people all over the world admired him. In 1964, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He won it because he taught others to fight with words, not fists. Martin went wherever people needed help. In April 1968, he went to Memphis, Tennessee. He went to help garbage collectors who were on strike. He walked with them and talked with them and sang with them and prayed with them. On his second day there, he was shot and he died. But his big words are alive for us today. May we continue to imagine a better world of beloved community and make real the big words, the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. So be it. From Reverend Susan Milnor, we pause this hour to remember those whom we have lost, those whom we fear losing, those from whom we are separated, those to whom we would offer a helping hand, a caring heart, and the will to live. We pause this hour also to hope for life and good living, for love and kind words, for reconciliation, for the support of family and friends, and for meaning in the struggle for wholeness. This is the time for sharing our joys and sorrows, and I thank Shah Ricky for gathering the news of the congregation. We begin by offering our speedy good wishes to, for a complete recovery to Jim Humphrey, who is recovering from an illness at home. We offer our sincere sympathy to Andy Schull, who mourns the loss of his uncle, Barry Riley from Ithaca, New York, on December 28th. To Joe Lakota, who grieves the loss of her friend's son, Lee Herring, on December 30th. To Maureen O'Haney, who mourns the loss of her cousin, Dennis Ferguson, from Hillsboro, Illinois, on January 8th. And finally, we offer our sympathy to Nancy Taylor and her family they mourn the loss of, grands, of Nancy's grandson, Zachary Maine's wife and infant son. Expectant mother, Jody Lynn Maine, age 32, passed away on January 11th with, along with her infant son. Her loss is grieved not only by Zachary and not only by the family, but also by three other young children. Let us hold one more moment for all the joys, the sorrows, all the losses, all the names and the milestones that are among us, that are very much with us. I invite you to pause for one more moment with me. Amen.
I invite you into a time of meditation. We have a piece by the Reverend Sarah Lawall entitled, Imagination Awakening Us to Possibility. Spirit of life and love, holy mystery. How do we pray for hope? How do we bow down or look up or be in silence or move among the trees to make hope come alive when it feels so far beyond our grasp? We breathe. We look within. We listen and we reach out. We hold in the depths of our heart that knowing, that knowing that hope is a gift we cannot destroy. It is the heartbeat always stirring within us. It is the imagination awakening us to possibility. It is the unfolding of faith in action. May we hold on to hope and carry it for one another and for this broken and hurting world. May we be vessels of comfort and compassion. May we be vessels of peace and justice. May we be vessels of hope and healing. Indeed, may love prevail. In the name of all that is holy, this we pray. Amen. Good morning, Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I am the Reverend Marcus Foliano, and I'm thrilled to share this reading with you this morning. I bring with me greetings from the Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray and Carrie McDonald, the President and Vice President of the Unitarian Universalist Association, along with the greetings and love from the whole UUA staff. This excerpt is from Between the World and Me by ta Coates, Coates is a black man. He is an author of several books. He also wrote for the Black Panther and Captain America comic books. In this reading, Coates re refers to the dream. He uses the dream to describe those who are enculturated as white. He speaks about physical violence against people of color. Coates writes, but all our phrasing race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it delodges brains, breaks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions of land with great violence upon the body. The forgetting is habit, is yet another necessary component of the dream. They have forgotten the scale of theft that enriches them in slavery, the terror that allows them for centuries to pilfer the vote, the segregationist policies that gave them their suburbs. They have forgotten because to remember would tumble them out of the beautiful dream and force them to live down here with us, down here in the world. I am convinced that the dreamers, at least the dreamers of today, would rather live white than live free. In the dream, they are Buck Rogers, Prince Aragorn, an entire race of Skywalkers. To awaken them is to reveal that they are an empire of humans and like all empire of humans are built on the destruction of the body. It is to strain their nobility, to make them vulnerable, fallible, breakable humans. So you must wake up every morning knowing that no promise is unbreakable, least of all the promise of waking up at all. This is not despair. 
These are the preferences of the universe itself. Ber verbs over nouns, actions over states, struggle over hope. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow? begin by giving away the sermon. In the midst of wrestling with the greatest of struggles, we run the risk of reduction. And in that reduction, we miss meaning and details. The detail I want to bring out today is the impact of racism and white supremacy on our very bodies, in particular on the bodies of people of color, of black people, of indigenous people. My question is what might we, as a people of faith, do when how we treat ourselves and our neighbors comes from this treatment of the body and its related question of freedom of movement, of freedom of the individual, of freedom of the collective to function? What I'm talking about today in this conversation about the impact on the body is the competing dreams that we have before us. The dream of Dr. King, of peace, of people living in more harmony. And also the dream that ta Coates talks about in the reading, the dream of white supremacy and how that all plays out right here and right now. Every year I look forward to this Sunday and the opportunity to reflect on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of his languages and all of his messages. There is the oration and there is the content. I asked Amy Pop to offer the particular story today of Martin's big words because it captures Dr. King's essence and his language. And that book reminds me yet again of the richness of what he spoke and how much it has become scripture and poetry. For example, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted and we must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means, just to name a few. And over time, his language and his oration has become poetry, touchstones that are powerful and evocative. I think of his work and I breathe in that peace and I breathe out that love, all the while connecting to the dream that he describes. That dream is a way of kind of opening a window onto a different way of understanding what could be, what the shape of our world could look like, what, how we could exist in time and space, in real life. But of course, there's more than just the narrative, the poetry, and the imagery of Dr. King, 
He was speaking from real life. Author and speaker, ta Coates, speaks to that real life, the origin of the struggle around race and enslavement and white supremacy. He speaks to that in many ways, but in particular in his 2015 book, Between the World and Me. It is structured as a letter to his 15-year-old son, where Coates talks about how the black body has been subjugated by white culture and American function and practice. He summarizes in this book the history of assault on control on the black body while speaking from his life, his losses, and the trauma of the community in which he grew up. He says, he talks about being a father who does not offer comfort or consolation to his 15-year-old son. After his son hears about the death of Michael Brown from a white officer's gunshots in Ferguson, Missouri, Coates says, but you are a black boy and you must be responsible for your body in a way that other boys cannot know even while remaining profoundly out of control and subject to the system around you. He talks about not giving up a little freedom to gain the strength of community, like we might often preach in our Unitarian Universalist congregations, uh, mutual accountability, responsibility to living in covenant. That's not what Coates is talking about. Coates is talking about being on guard, for the sake of survival as the default of how to be in the world. This is just one, one slice of how violence on black bodies has deep, deep implications for all of us. That being on guard at nearly every moment of one's existence. For me, more to Coates's work is, as a white person, is having a glimpse of the embodiment of his point, uh, of reflecting on uh, going to like the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, where they have preserved the balcony where Dr. King was shot along with the line of the shot and the building across the street. There is a difference for me between the abstraction of oppression and even great documentaries and that direct experience of being in the spot and looking at that balcony. We are embodied with everything that has been passed down to us, the oppression, the institutions, how long the struggle has been. We are embodied. And the past couple of weeks, we have had all over again the question of the body, white bodies and black bodies and people of color and those who are indigenous. We have had this all over again with the activity in the Capitol, with the attempted coup, and how the white protesters and rioters were treated quite differently than those who were in the Black Lives Matter marches last summer. ta Coates is unsparing in his concern and in trying to get to the depth of the impact on the body. But he does offer a degree of hope. He says, it is good to have values and to have high aspirations. He is not saying to his son that there is nothing to live for. He says it is good to be in the struggle. But it's so important to be clear 
about the context and not underestimate the risk. Do not underestimate the power that the dream Coates describes in the reading that that dream holds over us. That the white male hero remains the strongest image in our culture. Look at, again, the attempted coup in the Capitol. This year, however, may be a chance to become more aware of the real need to fulfill King's dream and the violence on the black bodies that, that were the origination of that dream and to continue to shift and dismantle the dream of the white hero. In an interview with, today, with the Today Show, after this past November election, Coates acknowledges all that has happened in 2020 to bring about more awareness of race and class and poverty and policing. He is measured in his optimism, however, in the dream that is this country, the dream that's more about the one that Coates describes. Waves of awakening have come and gone even in our great democratic experiment. But it is something, it is something that our incoming Vice President Kamala Harris and Coates and many of their peers came from historically black colleges and universities, from people who have been cultivating the lives of people of color for a very long time and counteracting the harm. Coates talks about how for four years, when one is at one of those colleges or universities, for four years, the black people, people of color, are affirmed in their history, in their appearance, in their skill, in their very existence. That they have not just a right to, to live, but a right to thrive and lead and grow and create a future. And that is in such contrast to the constant social messages that say that whiteness and blondness and the Skywalker and the Superman are still better. We still have those messages, still those messages in abundance around us and in that also comes with the flip side of criminalizing blackness. That is still the case among us as well. There is an opportunity to take up Dr. King's words, the call to the white liberal churches to show up and speak up. Perhaps this is the liberal challenge, the liberal question. It is this dream, Coates's dream, that I have been in and have been able to live all of my life for someone like myself as a white person. And I can no longer deny how we are all bound to that legacy of violence. So maybe I can see the dream that Coates describes and the dream that Dr. King describes and open that window and ask, knowing that all of the history and legacy and possibility that is behind us and around us, what would it be? What would it be like to be a true body of freedom, a people, a human world, unfettered by the exercise, by such terrible exercise of bias and power. What would it be to be that kind of body of authentic freedom, responsibility, abundance, and future? I would rather live in the struggle than live in the illusion. I would rather live in the struggle 
than live in the illusion. I think there is a road to the dream of Dr. King. We get to be authentic and honest about the nature of what has been, our place in it, and all the work that is to come. It has only been 150 years or so since the first chains came off the bodies themselves. How shall we take care of the chains that remain? Let that be our call. Let that be our work as we go forward. Amen. together is finished, but our work is not done. May our spirits be renewed and our resolve strengthened. We will meet the challenges of the days to come. Let us go forth. We extinguish this flame. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. May we go forth, so blessed by all of those who have come before us, the dreams that they have offered, grounded in reality, that indicate the future that we might create together. Let us go forth to this good work. Our worship is ended. 
Let our service begin.